My name is uh, Carter Pilcher, and we're thrilled that you're all here. I wanted to introduce, first and foremost, uh, our host and, um, and, our most, and our very distinguished guest, uh, Congressman Hank Johnson. And just before he gets up here, I just want to tell you uh, what he's done that's, that's important and why he sponsored this panel. Congressman Johnson uh, is a guy that we've been talking to, I've been talking to about short movies, which is what I do for quite a while. And he, uh, when, when I went in to see one of the first meetings, I think the very first meeting, I went in to see him, and you know, the first thing he said in the meeting was, I hate movies, and I'm a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, movies is what I do, it was it was kind of shocking and kind of like, I looked over at the guy who'd brought me to the meeting and I kind of said, what in the world am I doing here? And uh, he said, the reason I don't watch them is because, you know, they just have, they, they have stereotypical roles for black guys. Nobody from our community is involved at all. And he said, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And the more he talked about it, the more I realized, you know, I, I'm a white guy. I live just kind of in a world where it, where it all, I don't really think about it. And it is, it would be uncomfortable to not see folks like you and not have your stories told in, in movies. And so as we've, as Congressman Johnson and I have talked, I, I say over, we've started now a big, uh, you know, we've looked around in our company and, and we're one of the best openings for young talent. So Congressman Johnson got together with several of his friends on the Hill, and four of them recently, about three weeks ago, launched a caucus that, that doesn't look at media ownership, which is more what another House caucus looks at, but really looks at talent. And it's, so it's called the CAST Caucus. And Congressman Johnson is going to tell us about and introduce this, uh, this panel, but it's really to talk about how do you get more young people, emerging filmmakers, behind the camera and in front of the camera. So Congressman Johnson, if you could speak. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. When um, Mr. Pilcher came to the office um, to speak, I'm, I'm a member of the, um, of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee of the uh, Judiciary Committee. And so he came about uh, copyright issues, copyright infringement, those kinds of issues. And I don't think he was expecting me to belie my ignorance by being truthful and saying I don't even watch movies. But it was a true comment. and. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, do better about that now. I guess it shows the cynicism that has uh, layered me as I have grown up. Uh, you see, I was, I was born and raised here in Washington, D.C. I was born in 1954. And back then and all through the 70s and much of the 80s, uh, you know, people referred to D.C. as Chocolate City. And, um, you know, it's a place where there was 80, 90 percent black folks living. And so growing up here in Washington, D.C., I just grew up. Black folks is normal to me. That's my normalness is in seeing my people. And, um, and when I left here in 72 to go to Atlanta, I went to another uh, chocolate city. And... Um, so it's, it, that's normal for me. And, went, and then I left Atlanta and went to Texas, uh, Texas Southern University, for three years. And for the first time in my life, I realized that there were Latinos <laughs> because they made up 50% of my law school class. And I made some great friends in the uh, Latino uh, community. Then I came back to Atlanta, which has always been... Uh, chocolate, and uh, and now I'm back in D.C., which is uh, no longer chocolate anymore. <laughs> I mean, when when I came back here 11 years ago as a member of Congress and went down on H Street one Friday night, just rode through. Uh, you know, things were there like they used to be at 14th and U. 
and uh, 14th and U was no longer 14th and U, it was uh, 8th Street was the deal. And uh, now 8th Street is, uh, is no longer the deal. I, I'm just talking about how things have changed. And uh, in Atlanta now, we're getting ready for a mayoral election. And uh, we may not uh, be in control of uh, the city of Atlanta because of gentrification. Uh, after this upcoming election in November. But I'm saying all of that to say that I'm steeped in blackness, in my people, and, and that's when I don't see them, or when I see them improperly uh, characterized and construed, it, it, it concerns me. And so I've turned off as, as a young man and have been turned off. And uh, Mr. Pilcher came into the office uh, for the second time um, after our first meeting. Second time was just about a couple of months ago. And uh, at that meeting, he brought in with him uh, some young African-American uh, short film producers. They had just been at uh, an exercise at the uh, National NAAC convention in Baltimore this past summer and they had been given the opportunity and the tools to put together short films and so it was about five or six of them and they all told me about their productions these were five to fifteen minute productions that they uh, did these young people and it was a result of, of me being honest with Mr. Pilcher and Mr. Pilcher being honest with himself and having a sense of uh, civic mindedness and, and consciousness that he offered opportunities to these uh, five or six young people who are now, uh, they're now ready to explode with creativity. And uh, so this is what this panel is all about. How do we, because we must acknowledge that we do have an issue in terms of uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, uh, gays, trans, uh, uh, transgender, all types of people uh, on, in the media. Uh, we have uh, issues with diversity. And so that's what this panel is all about. I'm happy to uh, be a member of Congress who can then respond to Mr. Pilcher's initiative and um, and try to do something that grows it or, or that uh, amplifies the issue. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Pilcher so that you all can get started with your meeting. And once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Congressman, so much. The, uh, we have a great panel here today. We have some people from industry some people who are in front of the camera, some people from supporting groups. Um, just quickly, I'll introduce each of them and then I'll, they'll each take a couple minutes to just tell a little bit about what they do. Uh, first is uh, Tracy Ote, Ote Blunt, and she runs the Urban Movie Channel. Uh, she is one of the first women executives for, uh, for a mov movie channel, isn't that right? And so that's uh, quite an accomplishment. And uh, we have, um, second, we have Orlando Jones, who, whose face all of us know. And uh, we've all seen for many years, and he's an actor and has a, a, a unique perspective. Um, Felix Sanchez is the chairman of the National Hispanic Foundation of the Arts. Uh, and he is, uh, has an, a very interesting and different perspective of bringing young people into the, into the talent process. Uh, Crystal Berger is a producer, a writer, and a host for Fox. Uh, she tore herself away from covering Hurricane Maria uh, to be with us here today, so we're very thankful for that. And, uh, and of course, we have uh, uh, Hillary uh, Sheldon, and who is our uh, Washington representative for the NAACP, and a, and a distinguished uh, gentleman for many, many years, and we're thrilled, Hillary, that you could join us. Thank you very much. Uh, Tracy, if you would start. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So um, as Carter said, my name is Tracy O.D. Blunt. I am the president of Urban Movie Channel. It is a new streaming service that was launched uh, about three years ago uh, by Bob Johnson, who is the founder of Black Entertainment Television. We um, are part of RLJ Entertainment, so we're a distribution company. We have uh, two streaming services, so I'm the president of UMC, and then we have a sister channel, Acorn TV, which is uh, leading uh, British mystery and drama. And what's interesting is uh, Bob Johnson now owns 64% uh, of Agatha Christie's library, so he went from BET to British mystery and drama. But a few years ago, he um, called me in his office. So I've been working at the RLJ Companies, which is the corporate uh, organization, for nine years. And I, my background is PR, uh, public uh, relations, uh, uh, public affairs, and campaigns. And so my job over the last nine years has to, been to work on you know, various campaigns and move the needle on getting people to buy into you know, what we're selling, be it a candidate, be it uh, work that we're doing, uh, and the like. And so when UMC, when he decided to launch UMC, he moved me over to RLJ Entertainment. I built the company up, uh, this division, and was uh, named president in February. So it's been an exciting opportunity. That is not my, I'm not an industry uh, veteran in the sense that I didn't go to film school. I have, um, you know, not been in the industry per se, but I bring a different perspective. I bring strategy, I bring what I know with, you know, real life to the channel. So I'm really excited and I've got a great team. So we're uh, headquartered here in uh, the Silver Spring area and we also have an LA office. Um, and so uh, UMC, the whole focus is to be able to create opportunities for talent, creative, creative you know, writers, directors, producers, the opportunity to tell their story in their own words without any restrictions. Um, and we want to be that distribution platform and that home for the creative community to come and tell their stories. And as Representative Johnson talked about when you know, you, you've been you know, in the black community for a long time, only we can tell our stories the way we know them to be, not whitewash, not, you know, you've got this um, uh, sponsor or, or advertiser that doesn't like the way something has been said or, or perceived. So we're really, really excited that we've opened the doors and that UMC is open for business. And you know, we're, we're also a subscription uh, a VOD service, so we're similar to a Netflix, uh, but again, focused on urban and African-American content. And we are really, really excited to be in the business. So thank you, Orlando. My name is Orlando Jones. Uh, shall I use the microphone? Sure. All right. Hi, my name is Orlando Jones. I've spent most of my career as a storyteller. I began when I was 17, 18 years old with a company called Homeboys Productions, and I started producing commercials and industrial films to corporations around that time. That led me to a writing job on a show called The Different World, and it's fourth season. I got that job when I was 19 years old. I worked there on writing television shows like Martin and The Sinbad Show as a writer-producer for four or five years transition to the FX network when they were launching into cable out of New York City, helped launch that network along with uh, Tom Bergeron and Jeff Probst and Phil Kogan. At that time, we were trying to workshop what people now call reality television. And at the time, it was just us making television within the confines of one set in New York. I transitioned from there to Mad TV, where as a writer-performer on that show for a couple of years, left there and went into the feature business and have been blessed enough to sort of work in every genre of that business both in front of the camera, behind the camera, as a producer and what have you. And most recently, I've been working with the wonderful people over at Stars and Fremantle on a show called American Gods, which I'm proud to say has, frankly, more representation than people realize. It has put forth uh, Yatide Badaki, an African woman who's playing the role of the Queen of Sheba. It has put forth Mr. Nancy, an African god, who is now playing one of the lead roles in that series moving forward. It brings Ricky Whittle a British Af uh, actor to uh, American soil to also tell the story of Shadow Moon. And when you look at the depths of that story, what you find is multiculturalism in the way that we hope to see our representation move forward in the future. Uh, for me, as a storyteller and having worked in television, film, reality, and what have you, I think the primary issue that we always find ourselves into is that uh, the story only becomes multicultural when it gets to casting. That's usually the 11th hour. So the storyteller themselves 
are not generally people of color, and so when you look at involving young people, we often run into the case of they don't have the experience and they need to apprentice in order to get to the stage of knowing how to tell those stories in a way that is mainstream. So our hope on this panel is to achieve that. I thank you for having me, and I pass the torch to the wonderful Felix. Thank you, Orlando. You know, it's such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, all of us are so passionate about what we are doing, and I think that you all understand why it's necessary. Uh, the National Hispanic Foundation for the Arts was launched 21 years ago by then First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, and um, it was founded by actors Jimmy Smits, Isai Morales, Meryl Julia, and Sonia Braga and myself. Thank you. And you know, when you think about it, 21 years ago, we were talking about the exact same <laughs> topics. You know, lack of you know, diversity, uh, lack of inclusion, uh, lack of storytellers. And, and it's, what happens is Hollywood um, gives opportunities to creators. And these creators say, OK, this is my one big shot. I'm not going to blow it. I'm going to try to get the best actors that I can get. And when they think about best, they don't think about us. And so it's only because of all of the cable options, of all of the content that Net, uh, Netflix is developing, that there are now uh, uh, black and brown and Asian storytellers that are, are taking, taking their stories and building their ideas, and with channels like yours that is looking for, for this kind of talent. What we decided to do uh, in trying to figure out how do we impact, how do we create this change, was to um, scholarship students at eight universities that at the graduate school level that had a pipeline into the entertainment industry already. So we are at NYU, Columbia, Yale, Harvard, Northwestern, USC, UCLA, and the University of Texas at Austin. And what we've done is the, the kids that are there are already got themselves into the program. And mind you, there's often uh, maybe 12 to 18 people that get accepted each year. It's, it's much harder uh, than to go to law school or to go to medical school. These graduate programs are very competitive. But once they've been at those schools, they still can't bridge over and get jobs. And so it's only been in the last two, three years that we have, uh, that the, there's been a demand, that people are interested in their storytelling, uh, and that we are, are building this, this sort of uh, team of, and, and, and core of talent. And um, one of the things that, that happened last year was Fusion uh, Television, which is a platform under Univision, uh, it's an English language platform, um, they gave us $200,000 to do short content. So we did 10 documentaries, five to seven minutes, and we did four 25-minute 25, 25 narratives that were, uh, we, we gave 25,000 to each one of those, so a total of 200,000. And that short narrative content development allows these students to then build their portfolio, say that it aired on Fusion, you know, submit them, you know, to other, you know, festivals. And that's part of that process that it takes to get people to launch them into, the, into a proper filmmaking program. And that is what we've been involved with, and I look forward to uh, sharing more thoughts with you as, as we go on. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Crystal Berger. I'm a senior booking producer and writer for the Fox News Channel in New York. I also host a podcast for Fox News, and I'm a regular contributor for the Dr. Oz Show. And so for me today, um, I'm excited to be amongst such a distinguished panel, but also um, thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity to be here. Um, knowing that uh, I have to be comfortable a lot of times with being the only one in the room um, in order to create opportunities and access to others. So my role as a senior booking producer, I do know that a lot of the talent that I can bring in is because of my Rolodex. And a lot of times the Rolodex doesn't change because there's no one like me in the room. And so um, I think that it's a unique opportunity for people to go into spaces that traditionally they wouldn't go to create access and opportunity to learn and also to grow and then ultimately take over. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
My name is Hillary Shelton. I'm the director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau and serve as Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy. First, I want to thank our friend Congressman Johnson for putting this panel together. It is so important that our eyes are always on the prize on how we are perceived, how we are looked at, how the world sees us through the, the uh, lens of media. In essence, the NAACP is 108 years old, and through that we've learned a lot of lessons. One is that because we're still in a country and a world that has a tendency to be quite segregated in many ways, that those perceptions that we get through the media actually determine the realities that we oftentimes live. In essence, we've done uh, reports called Out of Focus, Out of Sync. Out of Focus, Out of Sync looks at how African Americans are treated in television, in primetime television, as a matter of fact, very specifically. If you go back and look at some of the challenges we had at the beginnings of these res the research that we did, one of the things we learned is that African Americans were too often finding ourselves in positions, even look at the news for a moment, I'm going to go to film in just a second. If you look at the news, we're oftentimes portrayed as the perpetrator of violence, of crime, and all the ugliness, but not as the victim. <coughs> but we know that when we look at issues of real crime and violence, most crimes are committed by someone who is the same race and ethnicity as the victims of the crime. So the misrepresentation is there. Then we look at the number of times that we're perceived in our, our portrayed in film or television as someone that might be even a president of the United States. It took a little while for us to get to that point, didn't it? Just a few minutes before we got an actual <coughs> African-American president of the United States. But those images are so crucially important, and those who present and create those images are equally as important. We've seen what happens when we put blackface on TV, but they're not writing the story. They're not producing the content. They're not, they're not uh, directing what we're seeing before us. We all still remember the black exploitation period, don't we? When folk were trying to tell us how we talk, how we act, how we do everything. We know how important it is to have creativity. Those who will create the images from the behind the screens, that will write the stories in the way we actually speak and not some stereotype. Those who are presented or understanding how the lens works. I saw an amazing piece just a little while ago about the emphasis that was placed on this one lighting producer, I guess, because he finally figured out how to light black folks on TV. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So being able to have those is extremely important. Even going back to think about the NAACP, 1915, Birth of a Nation. This is a film coming on the heels of the Reconstruction era in which African Americans were protruded in every stereotype as the buffoons so often seen. The stereotypes are sometimes with us now, in which you'd eat a watermelon in a way you thought it was some kind of skin conditioner, right? roving on your face while you're eating it. You suck that chicken bone so dry the dog doesn't even want to go for it. Those kind of images were being presented of us at times to make it very hard for us to become all that we can become as well. So you can imagine the NAACP opened an office in, in Hollywood the Hollywood Bureau, as a matter of fact. And we put forward those carrots to make sure we could see our folks actually on the job, doing the things that you actually end up benefiting from doing those things as well. How many of you have seen the Image Awards on, uh, as a matter of fact, we're on TV One now. It's a great thing to have something like the Image Awards and we show the accomplishments of African Americans in front of and behind the screen in the way that we celebrate it. Now, don't get me wrong, the NAACP will still march on you when you present us in the wrong way. We'll march on your movie theaters and everything else. But we want to make sure there's an opportunity to move forward, that we can actually present this data, present this information, create new jobs as we think about ownership and those who are now writing and producing and directing now more than ever before. So, Congressman Johnson, thank you for doing this, and we look forward to the questions that we're going to have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just as all, all of you, many of you have said, Hollywood isn't very diverse yet. And we all agree with that. It's, and it affects Hollywood in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Hollywood doesn't get the right stories. Uh, Orlando pointed out, and I think it's absolutely true, that you can't have a, an authentic story told by somebody who doesn't have any experience in that community. So as we look at how it is that we break down stereotypes, First of all, does anybody have any horror stories? Any really amazing, outrageous horror stories you want to share? Okay, but just, but but just just to give us all a flavor, mo most of us are not in in this industry. Is it bad? Is it really bad, or is it kind of bad, or is it? Uh, Orlando, you're a you're talent. You have to go to you have to 
pitch yourself every 10 minutes. Can, tell us, is it, uh, is it tough or do people, uh, you know, are you put in a pigeonhole or how, how are you treated? Well, everybody's in a pigeonhole, so that's not exclusive to me. That's just the way it works. Um, but I think to answer your question more specifically, I think the question is really about how we look at representation. And we don't really look at diversity. We define it as black and white. We forget about people that are disabled. We forget about gender. We forget about Latinos. We forget about all the mixes of black and white, black Asian, black Dutch, black Latino. We forget that we as people of color are the majority and our representation as a group doesn't exist. That's what doesn't exist. So when you ask how bad it is, it's, it's horrific. If I wear cornrows, then I'm a thug, so I can't possibly be hosting a talk show with cornrows. I was told that before. Right. Um, I've had the direction screamed out to me, blacker, can you do it blacker? As if that, <laughs> that was a real direction. You know, and I was like, oh wow, okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, to, you know, I'll swallow this R right quick and make this work out. Uh, but, 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 but again, a tricky position, right? Because on yep. one level, I don't want to see that person and paint them with the brush of being a racist because they don't know how to talk to me. Right. I'm on a set with another 350 people. My job is not to ruin the day for everybody there and lose my mind because this person says something so unconscionably racist. Right. So the trick in that instance is to rise above that instance and to try and build a bridge that can help me both do my job and not tear down the responsibility for someone else coming behind me. Right. But no one looks at it that way, right? The way they actually see it is you're supposed to stun on that. You're supposed to be, how dare you say that to me? And let me just say one more thing. But that doesn't actually achieve anything that we're trying to achieve here today. Yeah. But we don't teach young people that. We don't right. teach them that you have to be an apprentice before you can be a master. And they all want to be masters so quickly right. that you don't realize that what was unfair to you is an unreasonable expectation. Who promised you fairness? There is no fairness here. Fantastic. Uh, Felix? Can, I just want to comment, you know, something that's not readily apparent. You know, we, we always think, uh, at least I do, you know, that the, the, the wrong or the, the narrowness comes from the right. But Hollywood is liberal and democratic, and they are the worst. So it's like, this is not a conservative or, or, or liberal kind of a message. It's that people in power minimize us. That's the truth of it. Whether they're Democrats or Republicans or liberals or conservatives, that's the number one part. The Motion Picture Association of America issues a, a statistical report annually, and their 2016 report, if you add up the uh, African American, Latino, and Asian frequent moviegoers, you get to 48% of the, of the audience. And now, if we are working together and represent half of that audience, change will come about. But in last year, for example, there was only one film, Fast and Furious, that had Latinos demographically represented. And that was it, one film. And so, you know, this, and yet we go to the box office, we, you know, and, and the industry says, well, they're showing up to see our movies and they're buying tickets. Well, this summer, 25% drop in moviegoers uh, to the summer films. And I think it's partly because of diversity. And I think we need to keep pushing that to the Motion Picture Association of America and to the studios because that is one place that we have not been able to penetrate. There's more happening on the TV side and that's a very positive note. But we film is absolutely, uh, still needs a huge amount of change. Thanks. Uh, uh, Tracy? Yeah, I was just, I was on to, stereotypes? Going to add with with regard to you, you we're talking about film, but also uh, television and and cable. If if you look at the African American community, when you look at the cable subscribers, we um, usually subscribe to two pay. So one pay would be HBO, two would be Showtime, and so there are 13 million African Americans, so about nine million African American households. If we're paying two pay. That's, you know, 60 bucks a month that we're paying. That's a lot of money that we're paying, but we're not seeing ourselves. And so one of the reasons that UMC was started, we don't want to, you know, tell people to get rid of cable, but the idea is you could see what you want to see, when you want to see, and people that look like us 
for a fraction of that price, and and that is one of the reasons that we were we were created. And so, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. That's a great opportunity. And Crystal, what about you? Do you have any horror stories? <laughs> I won't frame them as. Horror I like horror stories. stories. <laughs> I won't frame them as horror stories. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I can say that I've had opportunities to reshape the narrative. So I'm a Baltimore girl, born and raised. And so um, with there's somebody over there that's very happy about that. <laughs> High five. <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, and I mean West Baltimore. And so um, when everything happened with Freddie Gray, um, I noticed that the narrative was definitely one-sided. And it was not just from Fox. It was from other entities as well, where they only told one side of the story. And so I went to my VP and I pissed or whatever, you know, just went off and I said, look, I need to tell the true story of Baltimore. Like, if we're going to tell this story, we need to tell all sides of the story. Let's get the state's attorney on the line. Let's get uh, Jamal Bryant on the line. Let's ha have the people that are on the ground in the situation and have them tell their stories. And we put it together. I produced it with one of my favorite anchors there at Fox, and she did a compelling job telling the story. And I had affiliates calling me from across the nation telling me, Crystal, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know what the systemic issues are because that's not their experience, right? right? If you're exactly. in a very small town in Oklahoma, you don't know what's happening in Baltimore City, Chicago, Detroit, you know, cities like that. And so um, I think that the hard story comes in is when, you, um, when your voice is silenced or when you don't push to make sure that your voice is heard. Yeah. And so for me, I couldn't be a girl from Baltimore with every single resource and not tell the full story. And so I think when you have a um, leadership that knows your credibility and they know that you're gonna bring the truth to the table, I think that they will at times um, you know, be open to, to, to letting you tell that story. So. Fantastic, that's great story. <laughs> And Hillary, do you have uh, just any any horror stories about stereotyping? Well, just, just a, a short, sweet one. I got a call one day from a television station in St. Louis. The reason was because they were trying to decide whether or not to fire one of their employees, a young white woman, probably in her mid-20s. The issue was it was Dr. King's birthday, and they asked her to go and pull images of Dr. King to put up for it to celebrate his, the, the holiday of his birthday. She ended up pulling up images of Paul Winfield playing Dr. King in the movie King. <laughs> in other words, I guess she couldn't tell us apart. I'm not sure. But, but, the, but the point is, it, it still really feeds the need for mm -hmm. that diversity. I would not have made that mistake. Others would, but who knows what would happen in other communities, other concerns. But the bottom line is, when we have that kind of mistake being made, where they can't even tell us apart, we know we're going to have problems when people are actually trying to write for us produce for us, direct for us, and other issues along those lines. Um, I, I just want to kind of, uh, on the stereotyping issue, the, it's, and uh, just to expand it a bit, because stereotyping is not only, <clears throat> as you know, TV and film are mass market industries. So they, they have been developed for the last almost 100 years uh, as, as certainly for film and, and TV, three quarters of that, as uh, focused on the technology, the storytelling, the method of storytelling, focus on what the mass market is, and, and primarily here in America. Um, we at Shorts TV have a, a television network here in America on lots of cable companies, and also we we have an international one in, that uh, plays out at most across most of Europe. But one of the things that you can see here in, uh, in the American experience, really, uh, is that the whole film uh, environment is, and, and it's the biggest in the world, is really focused around the white American experience. And, and that even goes all the way down to, and this is on stereotyping, and it's, it's, partly, it's partly the whole mass market emphasis, because Hollywood is struggling with two, uh, two big things. One is the technology, and I'm going to talk about that. And the second is the, this extremely rapid growth of an Asian audience. Half of Hollywood's revenues now are made in China. Um, Technology-wise, film, the entire process of developing film was designed and lighting faces, which is a huge science, and, and Hillary touched on that, was designed 
to favor the most frequent actors in in shows. So all of the so that's why often you will see TV shows, especially older ones and movies, uh, and I see lots of short movies that are that make it difficult to see a black face, and that's because the technology. Uh, the standard technology doesn't really work for an all-black cast. And lighting, the normal lighting science, doesn't really work. It's, it's just absolutely the case. So that's why, if you really want Orlando to look fantastic on screen, <laughs> you need somebody who has, a, has the understanding and the technology and the ability to actually really work on on making him look good. And if you want to hear a story from the Hispanic community or from Baltimore, you've got to have somebody who's actually lived in Baltimore or lived in San Antonio and able to write that story and tell it or it doesn't work. Can, so, can I make a, just a, a yes. point of what you were talking about? Uh, there's a new um, HBO show called Deuces that's, that's out. It's, um, it, it's sort of set in the 1970s in New York City, and it's about the pornography industry and its development. I was with James Franco, uh, uh, with George Pelicanos, who also did The Wire, mm -hmm. and George said to me, it's really a black-brown story, but HBO wanted a white lead and a, a two white leads, and so Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Franco are, the story is told through them. It's exactly what you were saying, uh, Carter. I mean, the, they still cannot present the story that is legitimately about a, a black-brown world through those voices and those faces, and that's part. Of, and that's a current-day issue, right there, right and, there. And and do you think, uh, uh, Felix? Sorry, do you think that that's because the talent doesn't exist? No, because from a marketing merchandising point of view, they think that that leads to a very broad audience, and that keeps their white viewers watching because they are watching them, and it. And then black and brown viewers watch it because the content is about them. So it's it's a strategy, uh, hmm. and it's a Absolutely. strategy that they keep employing. But so, so it, was same, it was the same strategy that was utilized for Drumline. L the studio literally told us that if we put a white person in the movie, it didn't have to be a famous white person, they would give us an additional eight million dollars. If we did not put that random white person into the movie, they would give us fourteen million dollars. We got twenty-two million dollars for a white kid who's a very talented actor, but you've never heard of again, because the strategy was exactly that. For Biker Boys that I did with my friends Gina Prince, Bythewood, Wood, and Reggie Bythewood, Wood, we started writing on a different world together. The studio told us if the film was all white, they'd give us sixty million dollars. But as an all-black project, they give us $20 million. This is not a pipe dream. This is a strategy. It's the way they think of it. So when you talk about how we're going to build diversity, we have to first remember that these aren't technological problems. You can light a full black cast. You just have to give them the money and have the time and care to do it. But when you treat it like it's disposable content, of course you half-ass light them. The problem is lighting a black and a white person next to each other. Yes, exactly. That's the yes. trick. The technology has always existed. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. You well, see, it's because disposable you, that, content. So I just want to be clear that these aren't technological issues. These are people who literally go, it's, it's, for, the, it's for the black audience. How much the budget is? Make our day. Let's make our day. Let's not get it done right. Not technology. Okay. Bigots who do not care. Just to be fair. Okay, Tracy, what do you I think? I was just going to say, but it, with, with what you've just talked about and the whole strategy with, with feature films, the reason we only get two or three black films is because they don't think we sell, like beyond the U.S. borders. So a Fast and the Furious is global. So that's going to be global because of, of that. A, a, a Terminator will be global. They don't think um, Girls Trip would be global, or they wouldn't think that, uh, that Drumline would be global. Exactly. And so when the studios, when we talk about the studios you know, blocking access, it literally is, oh, we have our three or four you know, black films for the year. Tyler Perry's got one. So you know, kudos to him, because he's, 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 he's figured out how, how it works, and Madeira does sell. But the studios, that, it's all about the money. And so there's, again, UMC. What we're trying to do is be able to create that opportunity for right. people to come. Because we have so many stories to tell. Look, there are so many people, not just in Hollywood, but sitting out here, your children that you just said are, are, have graduated, 
that have a story to tell, they just don't have a distribution platform to do so. And and no offense to any of the, the great Hollywood actors, the Halle Berry's, the you know, Denzel Washington's, but there are more stars to be to be found and to be known. And so the we just we have we have a lot of work to do. And the sad thing is that it is twenty seventeen <laughs> and we are still talking about this issue. And we shouldn't be. Yeah. Especially I totally with agree. the majority that we've just talked about. So that's exactly right. Uh, Crystal? I mean, I feel like in, in this industry, there are so many opportunities that we have to create on our own. Um, and I think that's the key thing to getting the voice heard. Um, and whether you use your social platforms, digital distribution, I believe that we can really make a stronger, I mean, look at Issa Rae, right? So she said, you guys don't want to hire me? I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to do my videos and then I'm going to create a show and now I'm in hot, the highest demand. And so a lot of times we have to be very creative about how we approach these situations as far as getting in because the opportunities don't exist. I mean, unless you have A-listers that are going to put a diversity clause in their contract, then, I mean, what can you do? I mean, if someone says that we can't make money off of it and you don't have anyone who has the decision-making power in a position to say, I'm going to put my foot down and put this clause in my contract, then you have to create your own content and then show and prove your value to the network. And then the network is begging you for the content. And then they have to pay you what you're worth. So, um, I mean, stereotypes, of course, they exist. And I also feel like if you're not creating the content, um, then the stereotypes will continue to exist until you have opportunities for creators to be in the room and make the contrast to the, to the, to the narrative that's being told. Absolutely. Hillary, did you have something? You... No, just a bit. But our, our, it's, it's amazing our experiences to actually find the finest of the finest filmmakers. Most of them had to break through a mode that was simply a barrier for them that other our actors and producers and others did not have to deal with. Think about it for a minute. Spike Lee had to actually cash out about a half dozen, actually about a dozen credit cards to be able to make his first film because Hollywood wouldn't recognize his genius and give him the opportunity to produce. If you think about uh, Robert Rodriguez, we talked about Rodriguez again as well. Rodriguez was making all kind of incredible films and now a Latino brother beyond many others that was actually had to make $5,000 films on the border. <laughs> because nobody was making Spanish language films that would be distributed in the United States. He had to find that hole and fill it himself. But the Hollywood producers would not recognize the up and coming stars for some reason. So finding opportunities, quite frankly, for to have the resources to be able to move these films forward in a, in a very high fashion way. Quite frankly, I've gone back and looked at She's Got a Habit, Spike Lee's film. And it's, it's wonderfully done artistically and whatnot, but you could see that if the brother just had a little more cash, <laughs> how, how wonderful the film would have been and how much better it would have done. And, and, and the issue you raised about international film distribution is something that should be talked about as well. Yeah. The big, big money is made when you go outside of our borders. And they want to yeah. pretend that folks don't want to understand what's happening with African Americans, but I'll say you this. African American music, as you know, sells well any place and every place in the world. African American films do well too when we're able to make them, produce them, and distribute them. So hopefully at some point, that narrow mindedness that we're seeing with those that actually green light these productions will understand that, that a pipeline needs to be created and an opportunity for these young filmmakers to come up and actually produce these films that tell the stories the way the stories need to be told and not some stereotypical way that someone thinks on Madison Avenue might very well sell an extra movie ticket. Thank you very much. The, uh, uh, every year we release the Oscar nominated shorts, all the Oscar nominated shorts, and we release them theatrically. The first year we did it, there was a young filmmaker named Kerry Fukunaga, whose short film uh, he had Japanese descent, but he, his, his parents divorced and remarried into his, both of them into the Hispanic community. And so he was absolutely transfixed by the community and did an amazing short film that was nominated for an Oscar and immediately then won the funding to do a, a feature film called Sin Nombre. He's now the guy who directs, uh, directed Law and Order. He directed Jane Eyre. He's a big director. But the, the question is, how is it, these are, the story that he told was one that nobody would have ever heard before. It was about immigrants stuck on the border. It's uh, uh, in, a, in the back of a truck and the tragedy that happened. But how do we get these kinds of stories, stories that are really happening in America, how do we get them not just written and directed, but financed and distributed? 
Tracy, you, uh, you guys have one platform, but what are, what are other routes for young emerging talent who've, who've got talent? Do they go to festivals? How do they get themselves seen? Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of uh, what we, the folks that we find, and so in addition to the two streaming services, we also have a feature film distribution uh, service, uh, and it's RLJ Films. But we go to film festivals, and we uh, talk to uh, talent there, um, and so we're at some of the smaller film festivals, especially for, for UMC, and we're looking to, to grow that channel. We're at the International Black Film Festival. It was just uh, two weeks ago in Atlanta at the Bronze Lens Film Festival. And we were at a luncheon um, that uh, Queen Latifah was being honored at, and they did a fireside chat with Queen Latifah and Will Packer and talking about the movie Girls Trip. And the, the beauty about that movie was that the cast was black, the folks on both sides of the lens. You had the directors, the writers, and so it was, it was a completely you know, black cast. And I understand that the movie Panther that is getting ready to, that, that they're filming is, is going to be of the same ilk. And that, again, another thing that we, you know, sells beyond borders. But from a financing standpoint, that has been the, the biggest, biggest block for, for a lot of uh, communities of color that are, are trying to make film is getting access to capital. Uh, we at RLJ Entertainment had talked with SunTrust Bank um, because we know that SunTrust has a, a film and entertainment division. They do a lot also with the country music division. So we try to bring uh, talent together with a film fund and that opportunity. And so we were trying to make those introductions. We don't have a film fund per se, right. but when we are uh, introduced to content and uh, either a feature film or you know something that we're going to put on the channel, we will work and look at the formula of how we're able to make money, how the uh, talent and the creatives are able to make money. So it's a win-win, uh, you know, positive economic cycle. Uh, so they are making money because people are, are coming to the channel to watch it and, and the like. So, mm. um, but film festivals is, is definitely a place where, where we where you where we see find talent. People. Yes. Orlando, can I, I ask you a slightly different question? If you want to comment on this, um, you know, you because you have a, a very unique career. You have a kind of a, a broad career. You did, mm -hmm. and you did a lot of. Um, things like uh, Mad TV, mm -hmm. uh, Sound FX that were smaller, mm -hmm. um, more more original. Kind mm -hmm. of, you know, now you're doing big things where mm -hmm. 350 people are on the set. But you did lots of stuff where there were 10 people on the set. Mm -hmm. um, how does that kind of uh, story now with the internet? You did all this stuff really before the internet was huge, mm -hmm. but now the internet's huge. What opportunities does that create for guys who are doing stuff like you did initially? I mean, so I guess I'd start off by saying we have to shift our focus entirely away from this idea that Hollywood is the place where you need to go to tell your story. Okay. Like, right. Hollywood has been super kind to me, so I have no, you know, no access to grind with it, but it's yeah. the 21st century, and to be fair, the number one portal is the phone, the number two portal will be your slate. Uh, your computer or your gaming device, so you're four portals in before you even get to television and five on feature films, which at this point is a dying industry. So it's a little strange to be talking about you know, an industry that frankly is not as relevant as it once was. Um, what I say to young people is this, if you have 10,000 hardcore people who are a huge fan of whatever you do in your area, and you charge them, uh, let's say, $10 a quarter, four quarters, $40, that's a $400,000 a year business direct to your pocket. And the only thing that you find taking any money out would be Apple at their 30%, and if you make it a nonprofit, then them and Facebook will cut you a break on that. You can give part of that money to charity. But the point I make is that you have to, one, understand how the business works, and two, understand that the only thing holding you back is you. Go tell your story. YouTube is free. You need to build your audience, and many young people have built their audiences. But if you think that this is the days of Spike, where you're going to make something and Hollywood's going to jump up and notice it and then grab it and throw it into a theater and try and make money, they don't make those type of movies anymore. They make blockbusters because they're trying to do event movies. Yeah. So the business is about how I can offset risk and partner with Burger King and do this $100 million, $150 million property. That's the business. But you don't need that much money to tell a story. Right. That's, not, that's not really hard anymore. So as an example, in 2012, I made a graphic novel animated show called Tainted Love. Um, I made it with a web portal. I took it to Machinima. I licensed it to Machinima. I picked up about 200,000 people who signed into a database of their own volition to buy, uh, own volition to buy more content. I built a tour. I sold soundtrack. 
and I monetized my property never having made a traditional distribution deal off of a $250,000 investment Fantastic. that I literally got from a, a, you know, a bank and a branch. But my point being, that can be done if you are focused on telling a story to an underserved audience and you know where there are. But it, even in Hollywood, I knew that going to Hollywood saying, I want to make a, a multicultural um, graphic novel action comedy, what do you say? I mean, I know how that was going to be met. It was going to be like, that's interesting. What does Robert Rodriguez want to do? So, <laughs> so, you know, for me, it was also understanding that I didn't need that to do that. So to me, I, I really encourage people to... And did you make your money back? I did. Uh, I made uh, I made quite a profit on that, uh, a windfall on that. And in my first workings with Viacom in 2005, that's when I first started putting content on mobile. I wanted to do a television show about some Latinos. They told me, "Why are you a black guy doing a show about Latinos?" I said, "Because I have Latinos in my culture, and I don't understand why I wouldn't tell that story." So I did a pilot of a show called "The Adventures of Chico and Guapo." Uh, the pilot cost $10,000. I literally took Audion and Flash, made an animated series. I licensed it and sold it to Fox twice. All rights came back to me. I licensed it and sold it to Viacom twice. That show's still running in Latin America. It cost me $10,000. I did that again, made a secondary show, sold it to the studio again. But again, that was me using technology, using my skills as a storyteller in order to drive the price down, in order to make content that I believed was viable and put it in front of an audience. That is entirely possible today without us talking about why Hollywood won't let us in the door. Rather, make your content, monetize your content, and then if you want to go deal with Hollywood, you can, and if you don't, you don't have to. But to me, that's really where the future is. It's not in begging for permission. We're past that. Fantastic. Thank you. Hey, Crystal, uh, you're kind of the other side of that. You're not. You're you're more uh, factual and and factual entertainment, and if you call it that. Uh, can can you? Uh, not fake news. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. yeah. So can, so so. Uh, what are what are ways people who who want to tell tell uh, factual stories? What are what are the, what's the route for them? I mean, the challenge still kind of is the same because it kind of piggybacks what Orlando said. Um, one thing I pitched to Fox was this inspirational content that we would host on the network. And they looked at me and said, Crystal, that's not our demo. <laughs> we, want, we don't want to buy it. We don't really want to talk about social issues. And this is the reality of their consumer. And so I said, okay, well, if you guys don't want to create the content, then I'll just write a book and I'll go speak about it. And so it's about really creating the narrative based around your demographic and making that space and knowing who your followers are who are going to support it. And one thing that I did like that Orlando said as well is like, you know, there's no such thing as fair in this business, right? I think that's very subjective. And I think you have to be willing to know that if you go into spaces that aren't traditionally um, African American, Latino, Asian, Hispanic, um, that you probably are going to get more no's than you get yeses. And that's just the reality of the business. But if you believe in your vision, you have to keep pushing until you get the yes that you want, whether that yes is you creating that content for yourself or you going to someone who believes in that same mission and vision. So I think another way um, for financing is to do it that grassroots <coughs> way, right? That grassroots way. Indiegogo, um, Kickstarter, those are opportunities to get funding for your project, to get in front of some bigger names and bigger uh, studio heads that may be interested in the content. And then also, again, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like, I go into spaces where I'm like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> like it or not, I'm here. You know, and I think you have to really know that that is a part of this industry. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're Latino, you're going to have to make your presence known. If you're not in the room, then you cannot affect change. Even rooms like this, right? creating coalitions of people that have influence, that have power, that can really say that we're going to take these images, we're going to take these um, stories, and we're going to create content and come together as a group because we know we can't do this alone. And so if we walk away from these opportunities in this room and don't create those alliances, then we are weaker than we were before we even came into the room because now we have the knowledge. And so um, that's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for... Uh, on this, how we break the stereotypes down, and uh, for for uh, Felix and, and Hillary, I, I think is a slightly different question, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, there there are lots of Atlanta is now 
according to Congressman Johnson, uh, the the leading production center in the United States. I think that it, I'm quoting you. I don't know that myself, but I think that's right. You know, uh, so that which is kind of exciting. Yeah. There are and there are lots, and that's a lot due to the fact that there are local production incentives in Atlanta. The city has put themselves together and said, "We're going to win this business," and and it has benefited filmmakers. It's it's created an industry in Atlanta. What are ways? You guys, Felix and, and uh, Hillary, you guys interact more on that level. What are state? What are kind of state and local things? People who are involved in government and and talking to their representatives. What are things that communities should be doing? Well, <clears throat> doing I, to I support. Think there has to be more TV. accountability for these tax credits, because they're giving tax credits to companies that basically do not hire minorities, and there's and there's no way to to. You, you hold them accountable because many of these are goals. You know, it's like hiring goals. And then they tell you that, well, they needed this person that they work with all the time and, and they brought that person, you know, to Atlanta from LA to do it because that's who they know. This is part of that problem is that we offer them tax credits and then they don't hire minorities and they don't have any programs an apprenticeship program that is is a part of that whole program, and that's something that we need to get more delve into more, Congressman. In my in my opinion, uh, I would just say that, that we can be more specific about how that those resources are utilized. I mean, the the, the average kickback immediately in uh, in Georgia is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for starting up almost anything. That's a good beginning and a good way to start. But that can also come with some requirements. Creating the pipeline. What we're seeing now is young people are going to Atlanta. As a matter of fact, I'll be totally honest with you. I just dropped my 18-year-old off at SCAD last weekend <laughs> because he wants to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So he's there because he knows that things are moving in Georgia, but also we're going to need talent in the technological field as well. Mm -hmm. Making a film requires many things now. We're utilizing computers like never before. The technology is different. We want to make sure that our young people are prepared to do that, but they also need a place they can hone that skill an opportunity to do the apprenticeships. Let's make sure they can do that as well. Let's kick in a few extra dollars. We're seeing and making sure that when you're bringing your film to a Georgia to be made, whether you're Oprah Winfrey, Tyler Perry, or uh, Ava DuVernay, as a matter of fact, is doing film then, and many, many others, that we're tying them to a great group of young people that happen to look like us, that can learn how to write for film that way, that can learn how to do the technology, that can learn these other things while working behind those masters as well maximize new opportunities, new profits, and I, I think we're going to see, as you talk about new mantles, we're putting pressure, as things are, uh, with, with all the new technologies. We're talking to at t because they're looking for content. We're talking to, oh, thank you, Congressman. I appreciate your assistance, as always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having such a good time talking to my friends down here. I talk to everybody. But what we're saying is there's, there's so many opportunities we're not taking advantage of that we can actually guarantee that our young folks, as we're looking for that diversity, we've utilized tools of affirmative action before. They've proven to be quite successful and quite effective. We also know that one of the things that happens when we utilize those tools is that people see that there is truly a market for these kind of things, and our young people are there. And that's why I give you credit too, Carter. What you're doing with short films, allowing these new filmmakers to have a new opportunity to, to make short films like that, my 18-year-old loves to do it. He's done many, many. I'll talk to you about this after the soap. I can some of stuff to you as well. But the bottom line is it must be an easier way to do it, a clearer way to help define these terms. Last, last comparison I'll make is this. When I was growing up in St. Louis, it's an industrial town. But during those years, we had the General Motors plant right in the middle of the city, north side of St. Louis City. When one person that worked for the company wanted to bring their young person aboard, when they were ready to graduate from high school, they understood what the pipeline was. Mom and dad took you to the human resources office, talked about you coming in, things were set up to train you in how to do the job that you would be doing to make a living, to get a living wage, including insurance and retirement and everything else and whatnot. That system worked in, but there's not a clear system along those lines to be able to get into the film industry. We've got to create new ways, new opportunities, and new pipelines to have that happen. Thank you very much. May I add one thing to that? Yes, one thing please. that I think is really important about what you said, and it's also happening right now, and for a moment I'm going to toot what part of Hollywood is doing it right. 
What's happening right now, at, at, particularly at Fremantle and Star as it relates to American Gods, is Brian Fuller and Michael Green have literally hired an all-minority writing staff that has no experience. So this doesn't necessarily happen before. So guys who are on the Fan Brothers podcast, guys who have literally been talking about the show and commenting on the show, were able to interview for writing jobs on the show, and they got hired. Wow. So our entire Fantastic. writing staff was literally brought in because they believed that their portrayal of Shadow Moon and various other people on the show didn't truly represent authentic African-American experiences. So they went after looking for Latinos, African-Americans that were young, who were not in Hollywood, that they could train to do so. They realized it was going to be time commitment, but they felt it was their duty to do so if they truly wanted to be multicultural. So I really tip my hat because that's not something that Brian Fuller or Michael Green have to do. Michael's probably the biggest writer in Hollywood right now with Logan and Blade Runner and all those type of films that he's making. But that type of commitment is sort of unheard of. And if we can put more pressure on other people to do that sort of thing, then we won't be having these sorts of discussions. But most writers do not want to put in that time. But, but even right. if I can say, it's not just about putting pressure, but it's more it's almost more about celebrating the, the people that are doing it right. Agreed. Agreed. I, I think it's a and huge... Uh, you know, all of us want to do better than the other guy. Yes. Right? And so if, if you call out a whole... You know, the, the, the American, uh, American Gods writers, I think it... it Create, there's just an innate sense, sense of competition and everybody wants to be part of that. Yes, and they've done a great job of it, so I just wanted to say that that is one example in 2017 that is happening today and will be reflected that, in the next season of that show. That's great. I think it's important to mention it because I have to give them kudos because not a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, so. that's great. Yeah, Tracy. One thing, the one thing I just wanted to, to add is if you think about, I mean, this is, this is business, right? And so I just want to take a page off, off the sports page, something that uh, Dan Rooney, who was the uh, head of diversity for the Pittsburgh Steelers, created the Rooney Rule. They looked at football. 87% of the players were black, but there, was no blacks, there were no black managers. There were no black coaches, nobody in the executive office. And so what those teams did, and it was by virtue of a fine, but in order for if there was a head coaching position open or a position in the front office, it was mandatory that they interview an African American or, or Hispanic uh, person that was uh, qualified for, for that job. So why not do this in business? And it doesn't have to be by fine, but it, it's enhanced best practices. So when you are on on you know where you were talking about the the tax incentives and for where the cities. So when you're hiring you know for for those positions, then you're looking at you know people of color that are qualified to to uh, fill those positions, and then same on the talent side. So I think it could be transferable. They do it in business. They did it in in football, and I don't see why they can't do it here in the entertainment industry. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's true. The um, yeah, but and that kind of takes us one one more step, which is what does a, a gentleman like Congressman uh, Johnson do? You know. He all, all, I'm sure he agrees with everything that everybody said. Uh, Congress has, in the past, passed uh, at least the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, have worked with some of the big mergers that have gone on and, and focused on ownership of cable channels, which, as Orlando points out all too correctly, is uh, all of that is a dying business. But what is it that, that we think... We, we uh, us up here, really su uh, should suggest Congressman Johnson should be thinking about. Uh, does anybody want to, Crystal? I, I, I just feel, and I'm not a political girl in that sense, but I feel like we need to lobby for diversity in the arts, just like we lobby for health care, like we lobby for public safety. I mean, Georgia has created the blueprint, right? that could go into other states and other cities to say, this affects our fiscal bottom line and this helps create jobs. And these are things that we have to make our law um, makers accountable for. And so if we already have the blueprint and it works, like every time you hear, made in Georgia, right? That's, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is what happens in Georgia. You see that Georgia peach in the, at the end of the program? And that shows the power and the influence that a state can have in creating these narratives and giving the backing and the support that that creators need, right? And so I think having that as a blueprint that we actually lobby for, for other states to actually implement is like a key place to start, especially in a space like we are today. But the leadership has to be there. So, and I use, so the perfect example that Georgia's doing it right. I'm from Tennessee. 
And so Nashville, we have a, a film community there as well. Mm -hmm. But everybody sees the ABC version from the show Nashville. Well, there's an international black film festival that takes place in Nashville. And the Nashville Film Festival told those folks, well, you know what, why don't you just uh, put a, a slate of the black programming on, we'll give you these three hours. Hmm. So this is a five-day festival that the Black Film Festival does, and they, were going, they wanted us to merge, or want them to merge and just do three hours. So the focus, it, it, the leadership has to be there. And so if the mayor isn't buying into the diversity, then it's, it's a little harder. So. Right. Orlando? So looking at it as an economic model, first of all, hats off to you again for allowing us to come and talk to you and for being so interested in this. Like, I, I, you know, from one country boy to another, I have such respect for you and what you've done in your career. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I really look at a, a key component that we've seen happen all over and over and over again. So if I go back to a show like Sleepy Hollow, it was shot in Wilmington, North Carolina but we saw tourism go up 300% in Tarrytown. Um, if you look at a project like A, a Dolphin's Tale, it was a, a movie about a dolphin with a prosthetic tail that lived in an aquarium in Clearwater, Florida. The economic impact report shows that they had $2 billion worth of revenue come into that area over a 10-year period by virtue of that film. To me, film incentives need to stress upon Hollywood that you need to come shoot our town for our town. And by doing so, you invite other people to come into your town and other businesses grow, because New Mexico, nobody wanted to go to until Breaking Bad happened, and then suddenly, even though people would consider that negative, people wanted to go to New Mexico to see where Breaking Bad, so that's tourism, that's hotels, that's restaurants. That's how I believe you can truly create jobs, by making Hollywood accountable for the money that you give them. Right now, you give them 20, 25%, you own no part of the IP in any way, shape, or form, they take your taxpayer dollars, they go make all their money, you're not tied into that ROI. Any investor giving any amount of money, particularly the amount of money that you guys give, probably should want a better ROI on your investment and you should want that money to actually come back to your people and you should make them accountable that if you're gonna give them money all the time, they need to showcase your city, your people, and drive people into your business. I believe that's really key, but right now what Hollywood does is go, who gives me the best tax incentive, and I'm gonna cheat that place for this place, and that is of no benefit to you or your business. That's the only thing that I see that's sort of immediate that seems to make sense, but I'm just an actor, and so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, th I think the, the hardest part about this is that it's a First Amendment issue. And so you can't legislate the uh, demand that they create this content. But you can't put pressure when there are mergers. Um, that's when uh, they come for you know, uh, either congressional oversight or ex you know, we can write to the FCC, we can write to the Justice Department, the Antitrust Division. We can make our case there to them, and I think that one of the things that the Tri-Caucus cast uh, uh, could do is to hold a hearing. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be an official congressional hearing, but you could hold a hearing and invite um, a number of, of witnesses to come and testify. I mean, those that are succeeding, uh, you know, show, show the positive part to it, and then the challenges, you know, I mean, and you have advocates who can tell you what the, 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 the issues are, and then, you know, all of these groups have issues that they want you to address, which is the copyright infringement issues. Um, you know, they, they, they want, they need protections, and there has to be a quid pro quo, because you have to ask them, well, we'd give you these protections, but what are you doing? What are your numbers? You know, show us your stats in terms of your hires, you know, your, and it's not all at the entry level. You know, we want to see mid-management, and we want to see senior management asking that information. We don't have that from Facebook, really. You know, we don't have it from the tech companies. And the tech companies have so much control right now over our lives. So w these are issues that, that there, there is a way. Um, it, it's not about mandating things, but it's having an open conversation in public so that people can be aware of these issues, and that is media literacy. It's teaching our communities why it's important to either spend your money here or withhold your money here. Because, you know, we're, we're doing it voluntarily. You can't say, well, don't spend it. But we can explain why 
portrayal is important. Why, when you walk in for a job or you go to a department store, people feel threatened by you because just because of the color of your skin. And those are the things that we can begin to explain that when you have this kind of content, as you were, as you were saying, Hillary, earlier, and, and you show these stereotypes, it reinforces in the minds of, um, of the public that this is what this group is about. And right now, the Latino community is facing an enormous amount of distress just because the whole conversation is about undocumented, uh, unauthorized immigrants. And that is not the whole community. And that is not the voting community. And so, but that is the only message that, you know, I mean, you know, Latinos have been here since St. Augustine was founded in Florida in the 1500s, before Jamestown in the 1600s. You know, and if you look at the U.S.-Mexico War, the greatest landmass that came to the United States was there, not the 13 colonies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been here from the very beginning. And, you know, right now we're seeing a horrific attack in Puerto Rico with this hurricane. Every single person born in Puerto Rico is a U.S. citizen. You know, and, 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 and we need to remind people of, you know, our presence, our value to, to, to the country. And uh, this, is, this is the kind of things that I think uh, you, with your leadership can really help us with. Thank you very much. And, and Hillary, you're the la last guy if you wanted to share something on, on this. No, uh, I go back and think about what we did to increase minority ownership. And you need to... Oh. Before the congressman comes back up there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when, when we were having the struggle of minority ownership of radio stations and television stations, we created licensing incentives, working with the FCC and others to move along those lines. I believe there's a construct that we can look at that would create the same kind of licensing incentives using the IRS tax dollars and other things to be able to make sure that African American business ownership women business ownership, very much given, given additional incentives to be able to create more of the film content that we're talking about. So there are ways to do it. It's going to take a fight, unfortunately, with the folks we have on Capitol Hill. But we've done it before. I'm convinced we could do something like that again. But now, in this new construct, as we're looking at how films are made, utilizing the new technologies, and of course, the new mantles in which we show those films. Um, so I have three questions that these are three we're about to go to let you all have questions because we don't want to run out of time. But I have three fairly quick answer questions that I'd like each of you to answer. Okay? Just in a short, not a lengthy one, but just a short, it, it's not a one word answer. But, but the, the first one <laughs> is about uh, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Google, Amazon, and Facebook have uh, announced or already spent more than any cable network has, uh, t sorry, not ca more than any cable network, and as much as CBS, NBC, and ABC are spending on content uh, in in the coming year, each one of them is has announced they're going to spend that much, and possibly Apple. So quickly, uh, is it first question? There are going to be two questions on this topic. So the first question is just uh, not much more than a yes or no. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? An opportunity? Or will it just entrench the existing division of, of our, our system? Well, I think they're going to where the people are, right? So not everybody's just sitting in their living room every day watching television. So if they're creating new programming, it's creating opportunity, but they're also going to meet the people where they're, they're watching content. So you so. think Google, Amazon, Facebook, opportunity for the for the African American community, not no. Op there, if for original programming, there is yep. op there is absolutely opportunity. To just in, in in our experience and what we're seeing, you know, we're we're excited that we're you know leading the way uh, in in this space. But Stars is coming on our heels. Uh, Amazon, like Orlando's here at yeah, the spot. Yeah, no. <laughs> But I'm From saying, stars, but, but even Just, Netflix, yeah. but even Netflix, like there, there's, a, there's a focus now on urban content, and so I think there's opportunity for other distribution, uh, for other distribution platforms. Uh, I think yes, it would be good, very good, yes, <laughs> yes, good, very good, yes. Thank you. I, th I think the hardest part is, um, do you have the skill set to get your project? off the ground. I mean, are you presenting your project in the in the way that they want to see projects presented? I mean, because the, the worst thing is 
you know, to, you see a script and on the first page there's a typo and it's like you stop right there. You don't even, you know, you've got to, the, these, this is a business. You have to understand that business and you have to have um, the tools. I mean, you have to be skilled at what you're doing. I mean, this is not just, you know, wrote something last night. Thank you. Okay. I, Crystal. I, I definitely think digital distribution is the way to go, um, especially with platforms like Google, Amazon. Uh, even with the, at the networks, the whole question was, how do we monetize podcasts? How do we get more digital? Our consumer is dying, right? Literally dying. They're getting older. Nobody's sitting in front of a television watching an hour-long news program. It's very rare. And so I think it's a great opportunity for young, energetic people who could shoot a dope movie from their iPhone and really create a legacy that they would normally never have access to if they didn't have the opportunity to have people that would tell. I mean, the thing about the, the, the whole Google and Amazon on is that it's such a wide base that you can get so much content there that normally you wouldn't have showcased anywhere else. And so I think it's a great opportunity for young people to have the energy. Now, do they need to learn the business? Definitely. You know, they, they need to learn the business of filmmaking and television production. But if they can get their voice heard in a space that they can actually monetize, I mean, I think it creates legacy through entrepreneurship. And I think that's something that's awesome that didn't exist before. Thank you. I, I totally agree. Uh, quite frankly, in, in Washington speak, I like to associate myself with the comments of my colleagues. I totally, <laughs> absolutely agree. The, the, the one piece of this is also very important is how people watch movies now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're making films for that particular uh, use, that particular mantle, that, that iPhone or whatever it is you're watching movies on, more and more that's how our young people are watching them. So making them, creating them, utilizing that tool will be the most effective way to do it. So it makes all kinds of sense. Um, in the past, we've looked at uh, all the cable companies, because the only way we could get television is through our cables. We've we've looked at that as both a utility and a an a, uh, uh, an entertainment source, right? And so so we, in in a legal sense, have imposed some obligations on them to do uh, and to supply content from for more diverse content. The FCC does that f uh, for all of the broadcast channels. My question is, Google, Amazon, and Facebook, who are spending as much as any broadcast channel, don't have any requirements, any agreements, any restrictions to, that encourage them in any particular way to invest in community-based uh, community content, which is what I th think of this as. Then uh, <clears throat> they just they can invest in only in blockbusters, Netflix, only in things that sell in China. Should Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, should Congress uh, look at ways to encourage Google, Facebook, and Amazon to invest in content that is coming from our communities? Our ethnic communities, Tracy. Well, I was just going to say, are they doing that to the Hollywood studios, though? Sorry. Are they doing that to the Hollywood studios? I think. Studios? Uh, well, the. That, I mean, there's. I mean, if. I think certainly this caucus own, is designed. I own to, the. You know. I own the platform, so I'm going to put on the content. But I loved when we talked about earlier about putting. You know, I'm not. Call, I don't want to call them set asides, but but that there's a percentage where you include uh, people of color uh, as part of uh, the requirement. So they can't for Hollywood, right? Necessarily, because Hollywood doesn't uh, generally fall under the same regime, right? Because they don't license the airways from the government, right? And the FCC right? is what's in charge here, right? So. But the FC, but but the internet is different. The internet is, you know, Hollywood is making movies, and they might just, you know, you could have a movie company here that makes movies in Washington D.C. and sells them only in Germany, mm -hmm. right? And so they they would say, oh, we have products that are not using anything for the government, we're making it for a different market. But Facebook, Amazon, and Google, especially here in the United States, are utilizing cable and broad, regulated um, internet traffic. They benefit or don't benefit from all the internet uh, rules that we pass. So should they be subject? Yes. OK. It's your turn. It's my turn? Yes. <laughs> so I'm be trying to pass that, right? Um, I, I'm not sure about that because I, I think that it's micro-targeting at the end of the day, and I don't think we're taking into account 
that there's been a new form of communication introduced into society. And I say that to say there have only been two forms of communication in human history, one to one and one to many. One to many is TV, one to many is music. Uh, when Twitter took off 10 years ago and when Facebook took off, that was a many-to-many -many communication. For the first time in history, everybody in this room could communicate with everybody in this room with the virtue of a hashtag. Suddenly, 50 people could talk to 50 people at the same time exponentially. That's a new form of communication that humans previously did not have. There are no experts in it. It's a sixth grader. So I'm not sure that the next move we should make is to bring government into regulating the sixth grader when we haven't even figured out exactly what it is yet. Maybe when it gets to college. But right now, anybody who's spending content and giving more money to content creators to make content, I think is good. What Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google are doing is using data as a part of understanding how to target those audiences. That's not what Hollywood does. They're the kingmakers. So the fact that they're clearly going to make data a part of it means that if you have an audience and you fall into any category, they don't care because they're not going to give you a big marketing platform. They're going to look at who you're targeting and they're going to support you based on the data that they see that means you have a targeted audience that is engaged and transactable. So that's what their business is, they're engineers. So I don't know that we need to legislate a problem that's going to sort itself out, particularly for a medium that is so incredibly new. But again, I'm just an actor, so it doesn't yeah, really matter yeah. what I say. <laughs> well, I think there's two parts uh, to, to that question. One is, what can the FCC do? And the question there is, you know, are they going to regulate Facebook and, and, and Google as a, as a utility, and then it takes on a different kind of conversation? Or how, how is this, how is, you know, are they just simply a transmitter of, of uh, information? These are issues that the FCC has to grapple with. Uh, in terms of Congress, I think that there could be studies asked of CRS, for example, the Congressional Research Service, to study this and to give their opinion. And, and finally, it, there's a bully pulpit. And that is what the CAST caucus can do, is you can be the bully pulpit in which you expose or add light or shine a light on these issues in public, you know, uh, and ask them these questions. And, it's, and, and, and perhaps even shame them you know, into doing more. I mean, that's, that is all that, 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 and that's a lot that I think that uh, Congress can do. But I don't see it as legislation. I don't see it through this Congress, through this administration. So it's really, we're left with the bully pulpit. I think for me the question is, you know, does the regulation further isolate, right? And does that, will that regulation, regulation deter, you know, your Amazons and your Googles from creating this diverse, or giving the platform for the diverse content? So, I mean, I don't really know where that falls, but if that's going to be something that deters these entities and these platforms from giving people a voice, then I would say no, like legislation is not a good, a good, or regulation isn't a good option. But I, I mean, that I don't know. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, um I think, uh, I think not only can we think about it regulatorily, but there are three agencies that came to mind to incentivize. If you're talking about mandating, I think that's a very difficult thing. I wouldn't even want to go down that route. But if we're looking for ways to incentivize the good behavior, I think about, for instance, the FCC, of course, but then the Small Business Administration. Keep in mind, we could have young people creating businesses around making these productions. We always create a company whenever we make a film around the making of the film. So even the Small Business Administration providing new opportunities for young people to borrow money, understanding how that money be utilized, and do it at very low to no interest. And then finally, of course, the IRS. I should think about reducing taxes at the tax burden when films are being made that are, are as diverse as we'd like to see. We've seen that happen before and whatnot as well. It can happen again under this new mantra. But again, I think that the magical word is being able to incentivize the good behavior in a way that, they, they, that people, folks can make a lot of money and be able to do very well. If you think about what's happening in Atlanta right now, the peach behind all those films is because we've created an incentive. Yeah. for those that come to Georgia and make films along those lines. It's about incentivizing. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by a new panelist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, it's important to, to understand uh, who owns cyberspace. And who does? Well, I mean, the argument can be made that 
cyberspace was created by the taxpayers through the uh, Defense Department. Right. Uh, the initial investment to to um, that brought about the internet was through taxpayer dollars, and then uh, so this area of cyberspace is there uh, is there a need for regulation of conduct within cyberspace given the public investment that created it? Um, when you look at uh, this new issue with Facebook and uh, the Russians and whether or not that platform was used uh, to influence or affect the outcome of the presidential election of 2016, whether or not uh, Facebook should be subject to legal prohibition in selling ads to and knowingly selling ads, I don't know if it was knowingly or not at the time, but they certainly know now that they sold, uh, they sold the ability uh, to influence elections through the use of that platform mm -hmm. to a foreign power. Uh, what legal uh, implications arise from that, and should that be something that they can do because they are operating outside of uh, FCC regulation, or uh, or should there be some kind of regulatory system put in place that uh, creates some rules of the road? And with the rules to the uh, uh, rules of the road come a consciousness or social responsibility um, that uh, includes how does your um, how does your business affect well, how are minorities, um, what kind of stake, what kind of- How do we include everybody? In I think it's just that question. So these uh, are questions that right? our government uh, should be pondering and considering through uh, oversight hearings and, um, and through uh, new kinds of thinking. We don't, we living in, in the 21st century now mm -hmm. and uh, we've got to be thinking about how we can protect people and also how we can promote diversity and fairness within this new uh, arena. Uh, so I think it's an open question. I Thanks. tend to lean towards government having a role in setting some rules in this wild, wild west frontier that we are in. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's very interesting to get your perspective because all of us have a, a very different perspective and, and certainly those of us in the industry don't really hear very often, um, except through the garbled CNN thing. And so know. we're getting into a competition policy also in terms of uh, promoting competition. So you can tie the hands of your legacy, um, of your legacy platforms by regulation. Right. And they have to compete against an unregulated platform that mm -hmm. is producing revenues by leaps and bounds, uh, astounding, uh, you know, us in terms of, of the money involved. So it gets down into competition policy as well. Very interesting, thank you. Um, and I think because we've got now such a full panel, it would be great to take questions from the audience. Um, Arthur, or uh, Rachel has a, um, a microphone. So if you raise your hand, sir, why don't you, why don't you um, this gentleman had his hand up. Uh, greetings. My name is uh, Femi Akibi. I'm a Nigerian and I'm an international consultant. Um, thank you for the panel and their observation. Historically, Hollywood has always been financed by the CIA. I don't know if people know that. Now, my position is simple. What do we Africans do to tell our own story? Is to use our own money, our own resource, my question to the panel, what do you think about cryptocurrency for us? About what? Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency. To finance our movies. Oh, do uh, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, do any of us have a view? Uh, right? Cryptocurrencies, obviously, uh, it's an interesting market to get into. Cryptocurrencies, as I understand them, are by and large based on having a community that believes in that currency. So 
if you can build that type of fervent belief in the currency, then cryptocurrency is a way to go. If you're talking about how to um, tell stories to a global audience, I think that no matter what minority group you fall into, you need to figure out how to tell a story that actually everybody can find a way into those characters and those roles. That's what mainstream entertainment is. So for me, it doesn't matter if you're African American, Latino, what you are, it, it matters that your story is big enough, open enough, um, truthful enough that it can play in China, it can play in these other places because right. that's how we change perception. So I think that's really the important thing is telling stories that everybody can find a way into and that can be distributed globally. But I, I also think that in agreement with you, and I just want to make this point very clear, I, I'm far more concerned about diversity in tech companies than I am in Hollywood. Um, tech companies are overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, and if we do not find a way to break down that barrier, the Hollywood issue is kind of not so much the issue. Tech companies are truly a problem, and regulating them in the way that the question was framed to me is not something I, I think makes sense, but I think regulating them and make sure that there are more people of color in those buildings providing perspectives like the one the congressman brings up is incredibly important because no one there considered that because they only cared about money. Right. Thank you very much. Congressman? Yeah, cryptocurrency, the dollar, the, the value of the dollar, since it's no longer based on a gold standard, the value of the dollar, which makes it the world's most favored currency, the value of it has to do with the full faith and credit of the United States government standing behind that currency. Uh, people who hold dollars know that the government, the U.S. government, is going to be good for, to, I mean, that dollar is, is good. But a cryptocurrency, uh, who has full faith and credit? Whose full faith and credit stands behind the cryptocurrency? That's the real question. So, you know, this Bitcoin craze is uh, is going through the roof. I think one Bitcoin now costs about $3,800. Um, you know, the value is going through the roof, but if there is a run on Bitcoins when suddenly everybody wants to get their money out of it in dollars or some other foreign currency, you know, will they be able to get it? That's the real question. Uh, and, so and, and from our perspective, just if I can add, I think that it's very difficult to tell any kind of a story right now. If you, even if you have a lot of Bitcoin to, to monetize it is, is quite a... A, a feat. And the government is using cryptocurrency a lot because that's how we do our payoffs. Cryptocurrency is being used rapidly and, and pervasively by the government. So who knows how it's going to come out, but that's what it's being used for right now. It's not just being used by um, civilians. So. Yeah, well, there, there's a vast underground economy yes, that is. exists. And, um, and so you're proceeding, uh, you're proceeding at your own peril. Uh, but a lot of people making a lot of money off of Bitcoin right now, and it is being traded. But the question becomes whether or not, I know China just made a decision to ban the trade in Bitcoin. Um, they are looking at it like they, they are regulating it as a security. Mm. And so the more governments that decide that within their borders, they are going to have some restrictions on the trade. Uh, it's going to bring reality to this market, uh, I predict. That's just my opinion. Okay. I'm just a congressman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I first want to thank the congressman and his staff for this terrific panel. I love seeing the sort of connection between Hollywood and Washington. Um, quick PSA, about two years ago, we launched a dinner, multicultural media correspondence dinner, to bring together this sort of Hollywood with Washington to do three really key things. One, to sort of just to affirm and to thank the people in the industry, like yourself, Orlando, who have made it despite the odds. Um, second, just to amplify this issue of diversity, we're just excited to see what uh, Mr. Johnson and some of the other members on the Hill are trying to do in sort of trying to find both carrots and sticks mm -hmm. to um, get this issue going. But the third piece was to try to bring more of a connectedness 
so that we are aware of the different efforts that are going on. Um, we've had, now had two incredibly successful dinners. Um, we're growing the platform. And so my question is to the panel, what can we do to amplify this very strategically get together? And the second piece about the connectedness, how can we deliver more value to the executives like you, Tracy, and sort of the, as well as the next gen. So what can we do to come together? And I'd love to work with everyone in this room on that. So that's the question. Thank you very much. Tracy, why don't you try first? I was gonna say, maybe the Congressman will invite you to be a witness and talk about the issue um, and, <laughs> and, and the successes that you've had. Um, I'm familiar you uh, had reached out to us uh, last year to introduce us to the dinner and the schedule didn't work out. So we are absolutely uh, interested in working with you um, with the you know contacts that we have uh, between DC, Hollywood, and and everywhere that I think that there's there's an opportunity and there's some synergy there. So I would love to to work with you. Uh, I find myself constantly looking for action items uh, around things. Um, you know, I, as though I completely so support Black Lives Matter because I was already aware of racism. I'm not particularly in need of an awareness movement. Um, I need action items by which how we can solve these problems. So when we put together dinners and panels that have clear action items of things I can do, things you're going to do so that we can create the change we want to see, then I, I tend to find myself leaning towards that. But if it's just to sit around and discuss what we've already been discussing, that was my great-great-granddaddy's fight, my great-granddaddy's fight, my granddaddy's fight, my daddy's fight, my fight, and now my daughter's fight. I find that um, I, I am losing the patience for, for that. Well, I think you have to fight media with media. And I think that, um, again, I, I go back to this idea that a, a congressional caucus, this co congressional caucus hearing could well develop into that conversation and, it, and an, on an annual basis, you know, where you, you, you establish a baseline of what the issues are, and then you see, is there growth here? Is there sincerity here? Because, I mean, we all know that unless you can actually start with a measurement of some sort, you don't know whether there's been growth or not. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other part to it, which is, which is a little harder, is writing about this in opinion pieces, I, and I, I'm a contributor to CNN, and I write on these topics, and. Um, it's, it's, there's nowhere, nobody, there's, it doesn't exist anywhere. And so you have to, you know, I have to go back and I have to find, you know, uh, like I was looking through, you know, what, who had received Emmys from the Latino community. And, uh, and then looking at the fact that in all the major categories, Latinos have never won. That information is not out there. You have to document this stuff which is the studies, which is what Hillary was talking And we've done studies as well with uh, a Columbia University professor on these topics. And I think that you, you do need the studies, you do need the, the bully pulpit, and you do need to continue to write and inform so that people are educated about, about what the situation is. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Uh, or next question. Okay. Oh, well. Um, I'm Hedalia, how are you? Um, I'm an inspiring film producer, I know Felix as well. I also work in media as a freelancer. But I wanted to ask you guys, because I love film and that's you know, where I'm also headed, um, what about Congress helping uh, independent uh, movie producers and producers that are, film, that are filming online? How come we're not talking about that? If we are advising people to go online and start creating their own stuff, how come Congress doesn't support those people that are also starting to do content online or, or are independent as well? I, I, I could just, um, yeah, that is, you know, everybody would love to see that and other countries do have funds like this, but um, the one place that historically a lot of filmmakers grew out of was public television. And, um, and right now the situation is not good, you know, in terms of funding Corporation for Public Broadcasting or NPR or PBS. And, uh, you know, and we have a lot of legitimate issues, you know, also with the content that, you know, that PBS, you know, produces. They, they've done some great documentaries recently and they're doing one on the Vietnam War, but, you know, Ken Burns, um, you know, hasn't always portrayed, for example, the Latino community, even though, so much of it w was a part of the, you know, the armed forces and the Vietnam War. 
And so, you know, it's a tricky, it's a tr this Congress is not gonna add monies to those, to those pots. And there's a trend away from this, but, but, but the PBS has uh, nurtured a lot of filmmakers through their uh, consortia program. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be great to have more money there, but I don't see it happening. Not even if the Democrats were, were in control. It's just not an area that, that um, is, is you know, receiving that kind of attention or funding. I don't know, Congressman, if you. Yeah, you know, freedom is, is, an, is an ideal that is specific to America. America and freedom are almost synonymous. America and freedom. Um, generally speaking, government has been uh, characterized as a restraint on freedom. Government rules, uh, laws, regulations uh, restrain freedom. And so what we're going through in this country is a divide among those who feel that we should have a free market economic system, laissez-faire capitalism, no government involvement versus those who are for uh, government of, by, and for the people there to promote prosperity uh, throughout the economy um, and those kinds of things. Uh, that's a real simple way of addressing your question we are looking at things so simply as to whether or not we're pro-government or for less or no government. And in some cases, we need government regulation, and in other cases, we don't. And then the economy is always changing, uh, particularly now in the information age. Uh, the pace of change is so quick that government uh, government cannot keep up with it. Government is still operating under the same rules that we have uh, been operating under for, you know, a couple of couple of hundred years. And so, our process is not does not allow for quick review. We we is is impossible for Congress to be out in front of technology as it develops we tend to come behind it. And so now that we are, uh, you know, we're looking at things so simplistically as to whether or not we're gonna have regulation or not have regulation, whether or not we're gonna have laws, no laws, strong federal government, not a strong federal government. I mean, we're looking at things through that simplistic lens and it does not lend itself to the uh, reasonable and efficient uh, regulation of the affairs of the people in this particular time period. So that's kind of where we are. We really need people in Congress whose minds are as quick as the technology that we are charged with uh, creating policy for. And so it means we need more young minds, more technologically uh, adept uh, minds. Uh, we, we need new blood. Um, and so why Congress is not creating incentive, incentives for certain conduct that is socially uh, 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 good, uh, you know, it's because we're just so slow. But I think we do need to, uh, as a government, American government, the U.S. government need, is behind and we need to catch up. Whether or not we should regulate or not regulate, those are questions that we should be considering for every um, issue and every phenomenon that, uh, that is produced by, by the freedom that, uh, that we hold dear in this country. The reason why uh, innovation comes out of America is because of freedom. And so nobody wants to suppress that, that freedom of the spirit, that freedom of thought, uh, that 
mindset to innovate, the creativity to do whatever comes to your mind. I mean, nobody wants to, to staunch that. But at the same time, uh, the effects of that is what we've been talking about today and how it affects everyone and whether or not everyone is included or not in the benefits because uh, we all know we're all paying the price for it. So shouldn't we all uh, participate in the uh, benefits of it? And so that's what we're talking about now. I think that's the role of government to ensure that fairness and uh, equality and equity are, uh, are, are there for everyone. So, Congressman, if, if I might suggest also, <clears throat> I think this was a very interesting question. And, you know, government, it, we, we all, all can debate about and try to figure out if there's a way to have funding. But if there's a way, I would say if what we're interested in is how to make money and, and get a career to get started on YouTube, and how do you do that, probably one of the most effective things government could do is take Crystal and Orlando and film them, put them on YouTube, and say, have them tell you how to, how to make a, a graphic novel and how that project worked, how we made money. Have Crystal tell you how you, how you make a difference in the newsroom and how you create a story that, that completely changes the direction and how you make your own little, you know, and, and, there's a, and so those kind of things actually don't take much money, but they take some, because YouTube is impossible to find anything on, but those two stories are probably more instructive and more important for today's young people who want to make a difference on YouTube than anything else any of us could really do. And how do you compensate us for our time? <laughs> <laughs> That's Tracy's the CEO, and she's going to be in charge of that. On behalf of my client, let me just say <laughs> that, you know, the thing about celebrity that is very strange is that the business doesn't scale, right? I can't be in two places at once. I'm either making money or I'm losing money. I'm not like this. You make another one, you sell more today, you make more money. So because of that, you know, people often think, oh, it's fine, you're going to go do this. But anybody who's trying to use their talent to make money, you are a human commodity. You are the commodity. And what often happens is we don't teach people that you are a brand, you're not a celebrity. And if you don't figure out how to monetize what that is, then it is your family who will suffer. Because not only do they not have your time and all the things that you've committed yourself to, they don't have the, the tools to understand how to monetize. And so, so often our musicians, our actors, no matter where they come from, we see their families broken, destitute, but millions of dollars have been made for the machine. Yes. So for me, I will tell any story as well as my client will, but my client will not do it unless we have a contract on the table from YouTube that's going to pay her that money. That's all I'm saying, boo-boo. That's all I'm saying. And, and I'm, uh, I'm getting the, the high five in terms of we're over time, but uh, is there any one that, that was a fabulous uh, <laughs> thing to end on? Does, it, does anybody, do we have one last question? Oh, I'm sorry. Give him a mic. Microphone. Uh, about three or four years ago, I started my own like little production company. Um, bought everything cash. I didn't know anybody anything. I was really proud of it. And a company that I used to work for, they contacted me and uh, wanted to work on, uh, well, they wanted to reach out to companies that were owned by minorities. Um, and something in the back of my head just like wouldn't let me get over it. Like, I'd, something in the back of my head was like, I don't want a job just because I'm black. But my mom coming up dirt poor, I told her about it. And uh, she was like, boy, you better go get this money because she came up dirt poor and was like, if they're going to give it to you, just go get it. You're, gonna, you're working for it anyway. Okay. But knowing Great. that in the back of my head, I ended yes, up not right. taking it just Thank because I don't know pride or things like that. Um, but to see it come up front as opposed to like it happening in the background and they're not telling me why I'm being hired as opposed to knowing that I was being hired for those reasons, what are, where would you stand on that type of situation? <laughs> I know it's a kind of a tricky question. But. Okay, Crystal, you're, you're up. I, I, I would have to say it's, it's changing that internal narrative, right? And so if you're my, my mom grew up in the housing projects. My dad was a sharecropper from North Carolina. So my grandmother couldn't read. 
So for me to be able to go into a news network, because I know they needed a black girl, right? Um, and learn the industry in the number one market at the number one cable news network at the time, I was not gonna say no. Just because I know that I could change and reshape the narrative once I'm there. And what I do with the skill set and the opportunity that I'm afforded, just because I'm there, I'm here today, right? And so it's kind of one of those things where do you, uh, what do they say, cut your face off to spite your face? Cut your nose, nose off, off to spite your face. face. You know, and it's, it's that kind of thing. So, I mean, I mean, but think about how many things happen for whatever reason. Some people get opportunities because they're beautiful. Some people get opportunities because they're short. Some people get opportunities because they can dribble the basketball really, really good, right? And so the thing is, is that you have to really re reshape the internal narrative, right? And think about what you can do to position yourself to create other opportunities for people just like you. And so if you continue to cut yourself out of the fold, then how could you ever um, create, again, that legacy that we're talking about today? Because essentially, we really want to figure out how people of color can get into the industry and make money and change what we see on TV, what we see on Capitol Hill. And so, I mean, for me, I would say just changing that internal narrative, because you know what it is, right? Going in the door, nobody's lying to you, so at least you know why you're That's there, honesty. right? <laughs> And then you go and you prove your point, you do what you need to do, and you take those resources and you create opportunities that you would never be able to create without it. And that's just how I see it. I, I second that emotion. <laughs> Jackie Robinson did not change Major League Baseball by yelling at them from his television. He joined that organization and changed it from within. Any organization you wish to change, you must join them and then tell your story and your narrative from there. So cosign, cosign, and I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was some, someone over here with a question. Yes. Uh, He's been waiting uh, uh, Congressman? Uh, thank you. Oh, right here, sorry. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, I had several questions, but I'll, I'll make it. <laughs> Hold on for the mic. This was an excellent panel, by the way. Uh, absolutely amazing. My dear friend Tracy invited me. I came to support her, and I am so thankful to be here. So what you said about freedom and government and where we are here in Washington, D.C., makes me uncomfortable. Because to Orlando's point, the innovation and the growth of this industry is coming from Silicon Valley. It's coming from Facebook, Amazon, Google, LinkedIn. I wouldn't be surprised if Walmart jumped into the <laughs> space. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And they're not regulated in any way, shape, or form. Secondly, all of us are content creators. I went straight to live to videotape her opening remarks. So it's out on the World Wide Web now. I'm a content creator of her content. It was that simple because the phone allowed me to do it. And the fact that we're not having this larger conversation around regulating what's happening, because the police departments are talking about the fact that I can tape him being pulled over and put it on live immediately, that's content. If Facebook is creating six TV shows with more money than any studio is gonna spend, that's content, and we should be discussing it. And the opportunity for people of color is better today than it was 20 years ago, but it's still horrible. And I don't know how we fix that problem, but I'm thankful we're talking about it. But my challenge to you and this panel is, how do we start talking about the fact that government is so far behind. And beyond just the technology, all these technology companies have artificial intelligence and not one person brought up AI today. And to Orlando's point- Because we, excuse me, but we all are real intelligence, not anything artificial. But <laughs> artificial is being programmed by white males who don't understand our experience as people of color. And there was an article about how Facebook had to shut down the AI because it was talking to each other in a language that they didn't understand. Yeah. So what my concern and my challenge to all of you is, we need to catch up. And we're still having a conversation that we had 10, 20, 
30 years ago, and I'm challenging you and hoping that we can move forward fast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, was there one more? Thank you, Rachel. I, I just want to thank you as well, Congressman, for having this panel. It was excellent, and we all just truly appreciate it. Um, my name is Ursula Davis. I'm an educator, and I'm the mother of a filmmaker, Kiri Davis, who made the film a few years back, A Girl Like Me, where she asked black children which doll they prefer, the black doll <laughs> or the white doll. Um, and that was shown to millions and millions of people worldwide. Um, my question to um, the panel is, how do you think the stereotypical images of people of that people of color see affect them, mm -hmm. and especially our children? Can you respond to that? That's great. Uh, yeah, and by the way, that, that is uh, the subject of our panel discussion tomorrow from, what is it, 2 to 4? 1.30 to 3.30. 1.30 to 3.30. I can begin by saying it's demoralizing. Quite frankly, we've proven this issue over and over again. Thurgood Marshall took the two dials before the Supreme Court and made the same arguments, that it diminishes one's self-integrity, uh, self-respect, and, and really puts you in an awkward position not to be able to produce anything. As you've seen, what you've heard from everybody on this panel that's in the industry, they have a very high level of self-appreciation. <laughs> in, in other words, <laughs> but that's important. They're able to convey their messages across very clearly and without hesitation. When, you have, when children are, are demoralized along those lines by seeing the images that are created that are first artificial, but secondly, when you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say somehow I'm different than everybody else with, uh, within my racial group, that's the only way I can survive now, that raises some major, major problems for us. So it's important that we, we have those. I think one of the things that's been consistent about everyone in this panel is how we tell the story. The story about us in a way that is uplifting, in a way that's celebratory, in a way that recognizes that even against the odds that we've had uh, throughout the ages and throughout our generations, that we are here and ready to make a difference. That's what I hear when I listen to these people on, on this panel. And quite frankly, uh, when you have the kind of things, I, when the kind of messages that come across as we've seen that demoralize our images somehow or another, that because of the color of our skin, the texture of our hair, because the way we do things, we are somehow inferior. I'll take it one step further. When we think about issues that had happened just recently in Charlottesville, that is about advancing, again, white supremacy. And I hate to get into those terms again, but that's what it is. We have to recognize it. And then, indeed, when we see our images being presented along those lines, it advances someone else has been, quite frankly, supreme to any of those that are, that are, are like those on this panel. And, and it also creates self-hatred. And I have to say this, we have to be careful on the content that we consume. You know, I mean, we have people out, you know, creating content that only show black women fighting and pulling out their weaves and sleep. I mean, and so, I mean, and when, and when that is the, the top selling show on a network, then if we're consuming it, we're feeding that machine that will continue to breed that stereotypical narrative. Right, and so I mean, people can talk to me all day about loving. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about putting these show names out there, but I mean, I don't know who's on the show because I don't watch it. Just because I can't, I just can't consume it because when you go to I never forget one time my brother went to Italy and he was and he's a my brother's a classically trained opera singer. He went to Italy and to Spoleto to study for six months, and he said people could not believe that he was not a basketball player. <laughs> Because that's the narrative that people in other countries saw of a tall black man. He couldn't be educated. He couldn't speak four languages. He couldn't have gone to school where he studied classical music and theater. And so I think that we have to be cautious of the, the self-hatred that we have within ourselves that allow us to consume content that degrades, that demoralizes, and that continues to perpetuate the stereotype. Because networks look at dollars. And so if they see that this show is going to make money because we're consuming it, then they're going to keep making it. No, no, those are all, all good points. I mean, I, I was thinking of two examples um, of 
uh, how change sort of started to occur, but how limited it was. When Diane Carroll starred as Julia, she they they needed to the they were the the networks were under immense pressure to to uh, put a show on with black actors, and she played the lead. But they found someone who, in their eyes, could, was milky brown and. You know, had uh, and she wore a nurse's uniform, which they made her as white as they could. You know, I mean, literally white stockings, a white, and then that, I mean, you know, it was like, it was crazy. You know, if you think about it, and and but images are important. And um, when Jimmy Smith played uh, Victor C. Fuentes on L.A. Law. There was an entire uh, boost in Latinos applying to law school. I was one of them. I mean, I, I saw that show and I thought, if Jimmy can do this, I can do this, you know. And but th these are the, these things are aspirational. We need more aspirational images. It's not to say that we want to be in denial of the truth of our communities, but we want to have aspirational images and aspirational stories. And I think that those are, are very important because it does come back and it, you know, it hits us in the face. All right, so there's a young woman named Gabrielle Turnquest. When she was 16 years old, she became the first barrister in 600 years to receive a law degree in the UK. She is a black girl from the United States of America and you've never heard of her. I think it's crucially important that we tell those stories. But I also think you don't need anyone to tell those stories. You can just, as you said, tell those stories. I'm more concerned with the fact that Latinos are the number one minority in this country, yet they see less representation than <laughs> just about anybody. That's a little scary to me, because if we don't broaden what we see as wrong, beyond black and white and start to talk about the Latinos, the Asians, the Muslims, and all of the other groups that are experiencing far less representation than we are. Like, we are literally, the, we are what they aspire to be, but we never talk about them. So for my own part, I look at it this way. They were killing people on Tiananmen Square, and I thought, that's horrible. Why are they doing that? And they killed some people in Bahrain, and I thought, that sucks, man. That's an injustice. And they killed two black dudes, and I was like, it's, right now, we're going to shut it down right now. You can't kill nobody else. All of a sudden, I was in the fight. I consider that me being a hypocrite, because you didn't hear my voice yelling and screaming so loud when they were killing other people. So when we talk about diversity and we talk about what we need to do from here, I think a lot of it has to do about how we, we start looking at the other groups that are people of color, because the real clear narrative is this. If your skin is white, it is literally worth more than if your skin is dark. That's the narrative. You get paid more, <laughs> that's how it works. If you're a white male, even better, even more. But the narrative is still clear. Pigment equals second class citizen. So from my point of it, if we don't, as people of color, band together and start talking about the, the issues that affect us directly in our communities, then we're all just hypocrites at the end of the day. So when you ask a question like what your daughter did and how she moved the needle, I see a filmmaker who, who truly had to tell her story. That's a true artist, right? Nothing could stop her. She didn't need to ask no questions. I want to see more artists like that and less artists talking about, I can't wait till they tick me, because when they pick me, it's going to be on and popping. No, it's not, because they're not looking to pick anybody right now. They're just looking to make money. That's not their job. So tell your story. It's crucially important. No matter how old you are, no matter how you can do it, tell your story. That is what moves us forward. I OK, we have two more questions quickly. Can I, can I respond? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. So I think it's important that we promote positive images of ourselves. I, I mean, we can go for the money and uh, we can uh, go with what seems to be popular right now and it may or may not be positive for our children who are watching. E even though it's an adult show, you can assume that the youngest of children are sitting there viewing what is being uh, broadcast or uh, what is, uh, you know, what is being displayed. Uh, so I think we have an obligation to ourselves to promote positive images. And I'm not saying that we should uh, become Victorian or, 
super Christian or uh, you know super moral about things. But we should keep in mind, I keep in mind the fact that at the age of 63 years old, I still have an image in my mind of, uh, of uh, a, a, a black shuffling, uh, you know, head down, scratching the head and uh, deferring to the strong uh, white male who is the positive role model, the guy who everyone looks to, you know, the decision maker, the shot caller. Uh, and, and the image I have in my mind, deeply embedded, never to be removed, is that bowing and shuffling uh, and grinning Negro trying to make someone else happy and trying to, and in fear of, uh, of being assertive. Uh, you know, so those kinds of things. Now, I had other images, I mean, I could get that from watching uh, Amos and Andy and any other depictions that may have been on the media at that time. But there was also, uh, uh, you know, my daddy who wore a white shirt every day, black as coal, uh, tall, 6'3", uh, and the women loved him, you know, <laughs> and, and my cousin, and all of the other black males who, you know, positive role models who uh, I saw. But those images that are planted in you from an early age, even looking at the cartoons and seeing the black character on the cartoon and the white character on the cartoon uh, and the roles that they are playing, you know, that has something to do with what you think of yourself and also what you think of your people, what you believe you are capable of, whether or not you, are, you can, you can uh, go to the moon or, and beyond or whether or not you're just relegated to looking down at the floor and trying to scrape up pennies for yourself. So it, it's important psychologically and I believe that we have been damaged as a people. I don't think that it is by happenstance, when I look at things like the prison industrial complex, which has morphed into a private for prison industrial complex that feasts on uh, people who don't, who devalue themselves and don't think that they can do anything other than just be a common criminal. So we have an obligation to ourselves and to our people and others should understand the impact of their actions on society as a whole. Because we all live in this, this, we are all in the same boat together as John Lewis likes to say. So what, how I am impacted affects Carter and affects uh, Bill Gates and, uh, and everyone else. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel has a gentleman over here. My name is Javante Ward. I'm your AV technician for the day. I'd like to thank this panel and everyone in the room. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'd like to leave you all with uh, just an over, a overview of everything you said. I'm 41 years old. I graduated from Warburg Senior High School. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, born and raised. Um, Seven, eight years ago. And you this, look like a thug, too, man. I know. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. But the minute I open my mouth, they just totally be befuddled. They have no idea that they are actually dealing with a gentleman of intelligence. Miss Crystal, what you said today about our television shows, our made-for-TV shows, our uh, reality TV shows, they have actually centered too much on the negativity in our culture and our community. I definitely wanted to give you thanks and big up to you, my goddess, for saying that. We needed to have that said. It needed to be recorded on TV. Uh, Orlando, on behalf of you and your, your come up, man, thank you so much. Um, we watch you on YouTube back in Baltimore. We make sure we let all the kids actually see you. You are a cornerstone of what altitude aptitude equals 
success, my G. You were just that in my in my hood. That's where we look. That's the way we look at you. Um, real quick, I wanted to make this point known. Um, six, seven years ago, no one thought anything about African Americans being in the tech service world, Orlando, that you actually mentioned. I belong to that tech service. You know, it was a hurdle for us to get into this part of entertainment back in. I've built stages for Beyonce and everybody, but like I said, that was not known to us 15 years ago. That's something that we had to pioneer into. Once we put our foot in the door, it wasn't you couldn't close the door on this no more, but we had to make sure we built the bridge back for everybody on the other side, my G. I love you, thank you. And one more. This is our final question. Yeah, sorry, right, I was like flinging my hand over here, like I need to ask a question. But hello everybody. Um, first and foremost, thank you for, to all the panelists. My name is Kayla Primes and I'm a senior at Howard University. I'm a H-U? A. A. Um, I'm a political science and government major and a philosophy minor and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. So it is always said that we need young minds, but we are here and we're ready to create change. Many millennials have a hard time finding internships and jobs. We do heavy research to try to get in touch with somebody in the field we are pursuing and we never receive a call back. The next approach is to try and figure out ourselves, or trying to figure it out ourselves, reading books, watching documentaries. Um, kind of doing things blindsided, we still don't receive a clear understanding of our field. So then we go back to square one, trying to figure out how to get our foot in the door. Mentors are very much needed. What is the best way to get in contact with people of much experience and power? Do you believe there's a certain method? And also, do you believe that you solely need connections to thrive? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Tracy, you're, you run a company that, that would be a great place to start. Well, I was gonna say, so I was a criminal justice major. I wanted to be an FBI agent. I am now running a streaming channel. <laughs> uh, I think that mentors are, they don't have to be you know, someone famous or you know, high up. You have people that are around you. I, I look at, at my mentors and people that I reach out to that are you know, my, my peers. A uh, young lady, Farah, that works for me, she's a millennial as well. She's teaching me everything about Twitter, like everything new, I'm getting that from her. So it's a two-way street. So, you know, definitely focus on the people that are around you. As far as internships and, and, and trying to get opportunities, you just keep knocking on the door. I will give you my card. I've, I've met some young ladies this summer. We um, hired someone uh, that was an intern. And so, I mean, it's really being persistent, being confident going out, never, you know, never saying no. And as the gentleman just said, once you get your foot in the door, you just keep going. But I will always say that any connection that you make, always stay in touch. I think write, handwriting a thank you card as opposed to writing something on email makes such a difference as a standout. And that's how I do that to people. And when I receive uh, those types of cards, I'm like, okay, remember this person. But always stay in touch with somebody and let them know where you're going. Um, they may introduce you to other people or there may be opportunities and they'll come back and, and, and remember you. Um, and so there's, you know, just, just be confident. There's always gonna be no, we already talked about that today, that there's, they're, they're, the door may close in your face, but keep, going at it and you know what you may end up doing something that is not the job that or the, the major that you have but whatever you're doing you do the best that you can with it and you make sure that somebody just know that somebody's watching and and that'll create a, an open door and you'll always end up where you're supposed to be crystal you mentioned this but do you, do you want to just add a bit um definitely I, I mentor a lot, um, and that's something that I've just loved to do because I know I didn't have mentors. It took me until I was 31 to get into media because I didn't know how to get into it. And so um, I would say one thing I think with the millennials, I think you should pay attention to the, the importance of the human connection. And she just touched on that with the handwritten notes. A lot of times people are inundated, especially in industries like politics, uh, media, with a thousand emails. Like I have probably 15,000 emails a day. Literally, like from my job. 
And so there's no way I'm going to find this email. So, you know, picking up the phone and doing that cold call, it may make you feel a little uncomfortable and maybe awkward, but picking up the phone and calling your congressman and saying, hey, Congressman Hank, um, I want to be involved. I want to get engaged. Do you have programs? And not being afraid of, again, that internal narrative that you may be having with yourself, but also, too, you have to... Um, create the circle because we know that nepotism is real, right? So where I work and a lot of other corporations and, 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 and entities, people give their nephews, their cousins, their brothers opportunities. Filmmakers, oh, my, my, my uncle was a filmmaker and he helped me finance this. And so your uncle may not have had those resources. So you have to make sure that you create that circle and that network, meaning looking, you guys have the Google, right? <laughs> I had the card catalog. And so you have to really <laughs> go on Google, find the person that's doing the job that you want to do, and reach out to them and just do the cold call. And not just one person, find 10 of them. You know, until somebody says yes, but you will get a yes, but you definitely have to really be aggressive about it, but also really take the time to use the resources and create the network that you may not have been born into. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Uh, well, I, we're way over time. Uh, we're, they're going to charge us double for the room. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to a, a great panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for a great moderator, too. Thank you, Congressman. And, and thank also, you for a great audience. And thank you to the Congressman for organizing all this. Yes. Thank you so much, Congressman. <laughs>